really, Jim doesn't need an introduction. So he, he wrote all the big lean books um, along with Dan Jones. Um, he also set up the first not-for-profit lean institute, lean.org in the States, um, and encouraged Dan to do the same thing in the UK and a whole host of others um, around the world as well. Um, we gave Jim to license, really, to uh, talk about anything he wants to talk about. So um, it's called Lean Thinking, Past, Present, and Future. So that just everybody knows. Um, I am the old guy here. Anybody here more than 75 years and eight months of age? Come on now, let's fess up. Come on, where, where are the, come on guys, come on, put your hand up. <laughs> Surprise, there's nobody here older than I am. And uh, I was going to bring Dan along because he's 75 years and nine months of age. And uh, that would have made him uh, the oldest. But I uh, couldn't, and by the way, Dan uh, sends his regards. So uh, Dan uh, is my partner of 45 years in thinking about lean. Dave said uh, what I've been doing. Um, thank you for throwing in lean solutions. I didn't even bother to put it on the slide. Um, that actually Dan and I did some other books as well. Um, but uh, the two of us have always been the big think, long view people, uh, sort of in this movement. And that's just our nature that uh, we wanted to look backwards, look forward, where are we now, where have we been, where are we going? So I thought I would spend just a few minutes uh, today talking about uh, where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Where we're going depends on you, uh, by the way, not on me. Uh, you're the next generation. And so uh, where you go uh, does depend on what you do. What do I mean by lean? I always uh, do this partly because my definition has changed a bit over time that uh, I think we could agree it's a way of thinking and it's also a practice and you have to practice it. And indeed I find if I'm not out looking at things, seeing real gimba things, I can't think. Uh, when the pandemic came on I thought what a wonderful time, I'll just go to my island in Maine, it's not my island, I share it, but a little island uh, in Maine where I have a place where I live, and I'll just write some great stuff. And I sat down to do it, and I had no gimba in my head. And the years went by, and I really wrote hardly anything for three years, because uh, you have to go and see, and that's my version of practice. So just one other thing, that this is all about experiments. There is no grand theory here, uh, that this is all empirically tested. It's just PDCA, PDCA. But wait a minute, do it A3, 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 because that is so much bigger frame than PDCA. Uh, but the idea was to create more value with less resource, lean. That's how we got to that. And I think that's a pretty good summary in term. People get that. Uh, the problem with lean is that it also has a downside. Uh, by the way, it rhymes with mean. Lean and mean is very popular in management circles periodically when uh, they're in trouble. Time to be mean, you're gone, is what that means. So that's unfortunate. And it's also fragile. And when we were coming up with the term at MIT in 1987-88, uh, there were two camps. One camp wanted to call it lean, and that was my camp, and I was the team leader, so we called it lean. Uh, there was no vote. Um, and the other camp wanted, the, this is the HR people, wanted to call it fragile, or fragile robust. And their point was that if people don't believe it, if you don't have engaged people, and you don't have managers that actually practice lean, it disappears. Just magically it disappears. And I've seen so much uh, non-lean, where I went to see something two years ago, you'd say it was sort of lean, and you come back, and there's no evidence that anything ever happened. It's just gone. So. Um, I thought the fragile people were making a good argument, but I also knew I couldn't go around the world uh, trying to sell senior management on fragile thinking uh, for fragile production to create a fragile enterprise. It's just not what humans are prepared to do. So uh, I now have spent a lot of time uh, thinking about that, about how to enable good work. And at the front line, that's what managers are supposed to do, is enable good work. And at every level of management, the manager needs to enable good work by the next lower level. 
And yet, that's not what managers think, apparently, in the morning most of the time. Okay, so it doesn't just happen. Uh, it is someone has thought it through and said that every worker doing frontline work needs help. We all need help. And every manager at every level needs help. Now, when you get to the very top, well, that is a mystery of how that someone at the top who has no help, it's lonely at the top, you know, uh, is able to do it. But we'll let them worry about that for today. Okay, um, and what do we want to do with this? Well, we want to create lean enterprises. And by the way, lean enterprise, simple idea, that you start with raw material, and you get all the way to the customer, or you talk, start with a concept, and you get all the way to the customer with a product, a good or a service, some combination. But uh, that's what we're trying to do, is create a lean enterprise, which is a stable platform for creating value. Now, what the Toyota folks didn't say this morning, let me just help them a little bit. Uh, sometimes they need some help. Um, the Toyota, over the last 70 years, has never laid off a person as a permanent employee. And they've been through a lot of stuff since 1950 when they uh, did lay off people, a third of the company forever, in the Great Crisis. Uh, they were willing to create ballast in their organization in the form of money. So that in this pandemic, uh, to point sales were dramatically reduced. If you can't make cars, what do you do? You make Kaizen. Now you got the folks working on improvement when you can't actually make anything. And that's a commitment that they've made. By the way, there's no such thing as guaranteed employment, lifetime employment. A company that lives in the marketplace cannot make that guarantee. Okay, that's ludicrous. But what they have said, is if you will stand by us, we will stand by you. And what that means is for every worker at every level, you have to do the work, you have to countermeasure things as problems arise, and you have to improve the work. And that's the only way the company can defend you. That you do your work, you do it right. When there is a problem, you immediately correct it. And then you constantly are taking it to a higher level. So that's the magic, if you can get your enterprise uh, to do that. So uh, that is uh, created and sustained by daily management. Uh, what daily management is all about is avoiding deviation and real-time resolution of every single thing that goes wrong. And then you've got improvement, and then you've got Hoshin. And Hoshin for me, I think for Toyota, it's about the big stuff. You know that uh, Toyota for years and years has had a 3% a year improvement in fundamental productivity. And that's every manager's job. That's what you do, right? Whereas Hoshin is the big stuff that's going to move the needle. Uh, that we suddenly got to do something that's very different. We have to do a product that's vastly better. We have to move to a region where we've never been. Uh, those are the big things that are the Hoshin that they need to deploy on. So you've got daily management. You've got Hoshin for improvement. Uh, you've got, sorry, Kaizen for improvement. And A3 is the engine of Kaizen. And then you've got uh, the Hoshin. So that's the Lean Enterprise. Uh, we've been at this for a while. And I hadn't actually written this down until I thought about coming here. But uh, shocking to think that uh, Sakichi Toyota, who's the fellow who started the Toyota Empire, uh, introduced Jidoka in 1897. That was his automatic loom with the automatic stop that could detect it had made a mistake. The, the loom could detect that a thread was broken, and then it would immediately stop. So that is 127 years ago, and there's still not as much judoka in the world as there ought to be. It's been only uh, 87 years since his son, Kichiro, who founded the car company, came up with the idea of JIT. By the way, they couldn't do it. You can't do JIT in chaos total chaos, uh, any, any production scheduling system is going to be bad. And so therefore, uh, JIT can't save you, for example, from a pandemic, and we'll get to that in a moment. Well, then they put the Toyota group together. By the way, 300 companies in the group, uh, equity interlocked, they own each other. Uh, Toyota is actually a massive private business, and all 300 of those companies are stock market traded, and less than 50% of the stock is available to the public. That's not a bad idea for anybody. You might want to think about that. 
Um, the crisis of 1950 made it possible for Taichi Onum to push through all the things he wanted to do. Tremendous resistance. Nobody wanted to do it. Everybody was a skilled trades guy. They loved to fiddle and rework. And so it took a crisis to do it. The product development system in place since 54. That's pretty interesting. The management system was created. Uh, Eiji uh, Toyota led the creation of the formalized management system in 65. Uh, TPS was formalized in 67 for the big, big growth of Toyota. By the way, until 1967, there was no name for TPS. It was just how we do things. And in 67, they had these world beater products, the Corona and the Corolla. They were ready to go, and the other 299 companies in the Toyota group weren't because they hadn't been paying attention and doing what Toyota was doing. And so they put teams together, the Operation Management Consulting division went out and did, did lean to people. It's pretty tough. And they would create a model line at every company. So we're going to do that now. We're going to do it this week. Uh, you will not only do it, but you will spread it to every part of your company. We'll be back if you don't. Uh, by the way, that set a terrible precedent for lean consultants. That all the Western ones saw it, be a tough guy, uh, the famous five-day Kaizen. We're going to do Kaizen to you. And terrible idea. And for the most part, it's uh, really an important reason why we've not had the influence we wanted. Spectacular results, come back two years later, nothing there. I've done it over and over. Um, global spread started really in 83 with the Numi deal, GM, Toyota. Uh, Berniston was, uh, the deal was done in 89. Some of you are going to go see it. Uh, opened in 92. And then Dan and I came out with Machine That Changed the World. Now, it's a coincidence that uh, that, I think, really was the start of the S-curve in terms of adoption, in which in every country, in every industry, it is fair to say somebody has tried to do some lean all over the world. It's really amazing. Uh, we keep track at LEI of who's on our mailing list, uh, the people who have given us their emails. I haven't done it since the pandemic, but before the pandemic, we discovered that we had a name on our email list with a suffix from every country in the world, except North Korea. And we were certain that one of those other names from one of those other countries was actually North Korean intelligence uh, checking in. So what an amazing thing. Everybody in the world, in every industry, knew about this. And so there was this great leap in interest, great leap in attempts to uh, emulate that, what I call the first lean leap. And I would say from 1990 till the pandemic, uh, we could all kind of think, whoa, uh, we're making progress. But the uh, pandemic came along. I'm in my island in Maine, uh, looking out at the ocean, uh, very gloomy, and decided to take stock of where I thought we were. And I concluded pretty quickly that the first lean leap was exhausted, that uh, so many people had tried so many things, and not that much of it could be sustained. Uh, and then JIT was getting uh, credit for all shortages. Uh, by the way, when anybody says to you, is JIT the cause of shortages, what you say is, how much JIT, real Toyota class JIT, do you think there is in the world? And the answer is practically none. Okay, the world's run by MRP inside ERP in the big organizations, and when you go down to the little guys, they've still got Excel for production planning. There's no JIT out there. And I would say some of you haven't done it. But seriously, how can JIT be responsible for shortages when there's no JIT? And I've explained this over and over to journalists. And that none of they can't get it, they don't want to get it. Because a large part about journalism is figuring out who to blame. OK? Who to blame. The, the story needs a bad guy. So the bad guy became us. I mean, we're the good guys. Getting the bad guy. And as I say, that felt like relevance lost. And then software, you know, eating the world, uh, when you look at AI and GPT, and the fact that there was really no interaction with the lean community. I thought, wow, we're going to be eaten too. That we're just going to disappear from the world's mind share. And then uh, are we relevant to green? Interesting question, but that's not what most greens think. Uh, we're the guys who make it possible for you to have more stuff. And if you're a real green, stuff is bad. But anyway, 
So you look at this and you say, wow, we are losing our relevance. We should do something. Well, that means it's time for root cause analysis. Oh, wait a minute. It's even worse. I forgot about the fact that there's no loyalty between organizations and employees. And this really started back with uh, Reagan and Thatcher, uh, that uh, shareholder value is the end all be all. Uh, do what it takes, you know, manage those earnings. And we can suddenly arbitrage across the world. And anything you can't fix, which most managers would include everything they've got, can be outsourced to somebody in a country you never heard of, in a company you never heard of, and it's not your fault, right? So look, when you think that we don't have employees who stick with anything today, and that young people just don't know about loyalty, hey, how many companies, unlike Toyota, uh, could say over the last 70 years that they never let anybody go, um, uh, no matter how bad things got? Uh, people are not loyal for a reason. So, however, we've got to turn that around. And as I say, lean is a long game. It's not a short game, it's a long game. Endless cycles of learning, stable teams, stable employers, and that's not what the world has. Got the stagnation thing, and then Tesla. Uh, just deeply, deeply infuriating. Uh, I have gotten so many of those questions and quotes from what uh, journalists called, said, hey, you know, they've got this high-speed development process, which is how they were able to do the Cybertruck in seven years. Uh, innovative management, they can pivot, and of course, uh, must pivot endlessly, pointlessly. And then, goodness gracious, software-enabled products. I love that one. It says, if you're now a manufacturer, you don't have to have the product finished or right because an OTA is going to take care of it, okay? And of course, uh, Musk sells that as all OTAs improve the product, but actually about 90% of them are fixing the product that you've already experiencing problems with. So it just sucked all the oxygen out of the room. You know, stodgy old Toyota versus uh, heroic uh, Tesla. Wow, so that's a tough spot to be in. Um, and I just uh, looked at the cause of weaknesses, and you can, can read those and reflect on them, how many of those things you've done, uh, doing lean to people, um, that our movement is almost entirely a rework movement, because you say how much LPPD is there in the world where you actually got the process that you need to fulfill on the product right before you launch the product. That most of you in OPEX go around and fix processes that never should have been put out the way they are, or maybe were okay to begin with, but through lack of daily management have just fallen off. So it's a rework a rework loop when you think you're doing improvement. You're actually doing rework. So we haven't been able to uh, do much about modern management, which is a terrible thing. Modern management is a terrible thing. GM, uh, GE management, KPIs top down, uh, make your numbers. And so as a consequence, we created less value than we had hoped. Okay, so what can we do? Well, here's some thoughts about that. And let me just say, I'm here as an optimist. Um, I'm not by nature so optimistic for the short term. I'm optimistic about the long term. But even for the short term, and here's why. Uh, we've now got a tailwind um, that the world geopolitically, remember how the Americans were going to run the world? Didn't exactly work out that way. And you could, without giving it a thought, you could move everything you do to China or to India, or to Botswana, where they've not heard about, not Botswana, I'm sorry, Burkina Faso, that's my favorite country, because they've not heard about wages. Okay, you just show up and they work for three square meals a day. Okay, and that's what managers could do. And they did it for a whole generation. Uh, you could either fix the mesh you've got, or you could offshore it and outsource it. And they said, oh, I think I'll offshore it and outsource it. And they did. And now geopolitically, we can see this is very dangerous. And this is not sustainable. Uh, could employees again be assets rather than cost? And every company wants to say our employees are our most valuable asset. This is not true. Uh, these, uh, your employees are your biggest cost. What can we do about that? And is there now a once in a lifetime, once in a generation anyway, opportunity for what I call lean shoring? 
that uh, things are going to be brought back, if not all the way to the UK, at least to within Europe, uh, if not in America, at least in uh, neighboring countries. And we could do it right. But if we leash, reshore but don't lean shore, what you get is just inflation. Okay, that geopolitically you said it's too dangerous to be in China, I'll bring it back. Uh, one of our most interesting experiments that we've done at LEI over the last uh, 12 years is to work with GE Appliances, General Electric Appliances, no longer a GE company, to uh, reshore appliance making to the US. Uh, very dramatic, uh, very hard. Uh, we have all struggled, uh, but in the end, it's actually been pretty amazing. It can be done. Uh, we've been helping do it. So I'm an optimist. I think this can be done. Um, more reasons for optimism. We now have creative engagement, I think, for the first time with the tech world. That our response to tech was, it will go away. This too shall pass, and we can get back to traditional Kaizen. And that's not true. But you heard from Mike this morning, uh, which is a way to make Kaizen possible uh, without being wrecked by corporate IT. I mean, that's really the idea. Right? And uh, you'll hear from Fabrice tomorrow morning uh, about uh, the, what he calls the um, agile tech. Uh, what you do is take the Lean Manifesto of 2001, you put it in the mold, and you drop a copy of Lean Thinking from 1996 that Dan and I did. You put the two in together, you close it, you pressure heat, and then it pops open, and you have the Lean Tech Manifesto, which is a melding of two very different ways of thinking. And it's really interesting, and all of you should read it. I mean, seriously, it's a review of what lean is. Um, I, was, I was kind of shocked as I was reading every other page is about lean thinking, and every other page is about the tech world, and how we can put them together. And it can be done. That's the good news, it can be done. We can be part of the conversation again. We're not enemies, but allies, I hope. We have an elaborated lean management system. And by the way, we've actually uh, worked with Toyota a fair bit to make sure we really understand this, which uh, we really had uh, a lot of elements, a lot of pieces, but we didn't have the whole puzzle. And by the way, Dave's done great work with the team here to get LTF uh, into the hands of so many people and explain it in such an articulate way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, daily management. I think we know how to do it, but wait a minute. Uh, daily management doesn't work unless you have real-time problem resolution. That uh, you've all seen these production control boards that are all over the world now. And it's what I call the boardwalk that you have every morning. That's B-O-R-E-D, the boardwalk, where everybody stands and looks at the board and it has listed all the things that went wrong yesterday. Now they're gonna go wrong again today, but no, we've got some kludgy workarounds, which might work. And then we've got them all listed, and the OPEX team will come around once a month to start their Pareto to look for low-hanging fruit. You know, well, the fruit's already rotted on the ground by that point. So, no, that's not what we're going to do. Um, the, um, I think we're understanding that. We're understanding that an awful lot of Kaizen is rework, and therefore we ought to get there first. And we're developing, I hope, uh, the capability to good do good hoshin. Um, so th there's reason for optimism there. Uh, Toyota has taught us about concurrent engineering in a very, very visible example, EVs. And they have been denounced for it. And tomorrow morning you'll hear their uh, hydrogen story. But remember, the point of concurrent engineering is don't take the first countermeasure that comes into your head. Force yourself to think about alternative ways to countermeasure a problem. And so Toyota stuck with it. They're working on BEVs, harder than you might think. They're working on PHEVs, which, by the way, I love. Drove them for 10 years. Uh, they're working, you can, by the way, you can run uh, ICE engines on hydrogen. It's pretty easy. You just have to figure out where to get the hydrogen, which is the same thing for fuel cells, and we'll ask about that in the morning. Anyway, um, we've now, uh, I think, hope begin to teach people the idea of concurrency along with simultaneity. Simultaneity means here's product development and here's process development, and you can actually not start the process development until you finish the product development, 
or if you have a real deep understanding of each other's activity, you can actually squinch them up. And that's how you get to this rapid time to market. So I think we're making progress. More people are understanding. Um, and then finally, here's some good news. Toyota's going great, okay? That uh, this year, record production, 11 million units, record profits, record margins, record market share. Um, hmm. Tesla, not so much. Um, and that's just kind of satisfying. You can't help but be satisfied. <laughs> And by the way, uh, what uh, Toyota is going to come out with mostly is PHEVs. That's the plug-in hybrids. Uh, this is the gateway drug to electric vehicles. Uh, that if you can learn how to uh, charge your PHEV, where charging is not a range problem, then you can learn how to deal with your EV. And I've done this myself. I drove uh, the very first uh, plug-in hybrid Prius. Plug-in, yeah, plug-in hybrid Prius. And uh, did that for 10 years and then switched to all electric. I've got uh, the, one of the three people in the world who has a BZ4X, uh, which, by the way, is a wonderful car. It just can't go anywhere. Um, and that's due to a misconception about what battery uh, density, energy density was going to be. But they'll get it fixed. So, but look, this is serious, that we've had to do all this uh, excusing ourselves. We're the old, boring, dodge, uh, dodgy, stodgy Toyota guys. And then there's this wonderful, exciting future out there. We didn't have anything to say, but now we do. So please say it, okay? We're, we're doing the right thing. Um, there's a couple of other things uh, that we've got some cases still to make here. First off, we're not clearly enough explaining that lean can be the great enabler of green. Take the hydrogen car case, or the EV car case again. What's wrong with them is they're too expensive. What do we know how to do? How to take cost out of things, right? So therefore, our, um, you know, our mission here is to enable green good things by making them cost affordable. You know, most of the resistance to green in the public is that it's gonna cost a whole lot of money for no benefit that I can see because carbon dioxide's invisible, right? You mean you're gonna make me pay a whole lot more for a car that doesn't do a thing that my current car does, right? No. Well, we have to change that around. So let's get to work on that. Uh, by the way, um, this business about shortages, uh, here's the deal, black swan events cannot be predicted, that they will happen at all, where they will happen, their amplitude or their duration, and so therefore no production control system can protect you fully from black swans. But what JIT can do is protect you from normal variation. And that's what it does so brilliantly. It detects it very quickly, it adjusts, it adjusts, it adjusts small amounts frequently. So we have a problem there that we have to uh, fix. But wait a minute, for you OPEX folks, this is something you should know that I didn't know until recently, and I hope I stand to be corrected by Toyota. I hope this is right. But who leads what they call recovery at Toyota? Toyota says you can't predict these big, big events, but you can have a recovery method that will, as quickly as possible, get you back online and everything working again. And who should lead that at Toyota? It's OMDD, the Operation Management Development Division. When Toyota has a plant burned down, the OMDD guy is on the ground as the chief engineer of the recovery. And by the way, has a complete inventory of all of the equipment and all the skills available throughout the organization. And in Toyota's case, that's the entire group, the Toyota group of 300 companies, shows up. And by the way, doesn't have to take a lot of people with him, probably is a him, should be a her, but might be a him. Because at the company where the bad thing has happened, everybody is a trained problem solver. Every single person has done gazillions of four-step or eight-step. Uh, Kaizen, been part of Hoshin. These people know how to solve problems, and it's in their DNA. So for all you OPEX people, just think a little bit about whether you could get some credit and have some fun by being the recovery lead team for your organization. Just think about that might be a new career for you. Um, 
And look, uh, as a countermeasure for economic stagnation, the Bank of Muda is still open, folks. All you got to do is go down to the Bank of Muda and take that Muda and convert it into value, and we could uh, get productivity to go right up. Anybody want to do that? Let's do it if we get the chance. Okay, so final thought here that um, is important to me, this is just me personally, that we are transitioning from a founding generation, that's me, that's Dan, uh, we didn't invent a thing, did not invent a single thing, we simply were pretty good at writing down some things that people ought to know, that's all we did. But, and we got an awful lot of people to go out and try an awful lot of things. And it's just natural that the first leap, you know, that uh, that goes away. And subsequent leaps have to be done by next generations. I say those folks are the sustained, improved people. That's Dave and Peter and David. That you guys are the sustained and improved generation. I was the uh, get the trumpet and uh, broadcast the message generation. So I think we can have a second lean leap, and I'm very encouraged. Uh, I think just right here, you're very lucky to have LEA. And by the way, they're not paying me to say that. They're not paying me to be here. Um, that's, uh, yeah, 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 he would pay me to say that, but he didn't have to. Um, look, it's always difficult in what I call a missionary activity. I've always thought of us as missionaries. We're trying to get people to change both their beliefs and their practices, and that's hard get people to change both what they say they believe in and how they actually behave. It's always hard to make that leap from founding generation to next generation, but I think we're making progress. And so I have hope, as I say, for relevance regained. That's where we ought to be. So up to you, not to me. You know, I've, I've done my bit, um, so I'm just going to chug off into, uh, I don't know where, but uh, anyway, I don't want to think about that. But anyway, uh, please do continue. So uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted the work you're doing. It may be more important than you realize, and you should do it. Carry on. Thank you. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for the latest lean content.